good evening. Glad to have you here with us tonight. I um, ask you to would, if you haven't already turned there, to grab to uh, turn to the book of Ephesians chapter 1. Book of Ephesians chapter 1, as we are continuing to go through this uh, precious study of this book uh, that Paul wrote to the church of Ephesus. Um, we have uh, been looking at the first part of this um, chapter of chapter 1, and uh, we've uh, I've gone through that over the last several weeks and coming into this, this next section uh, of this precious chapter that we have been looking at, um, of chapter 1. Um, Paul is, is writing here, and he really comes to this point, uh, comes to the, really the introduction of this letter. So tonight we're not going to look at this whole entire section. We're going to look, I'm going to read through verse 19. We're not going to really get through all of that tonight. Um, but we'll pick up at verse 15 and listen to what the scripture says. He says, uh, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 15, it says, For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of Him, having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, were the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might. Um, I like what you know, Brother Frankie opened up with saying and reading out of Psalms 119, uh, focusing on the Word of God. And um, that's the whole focus of what we do and what we're desiring to do is just really focus on God, focus on his word and, and really allow the text to speak to us and, and God's scripture to speak to us. Um, Paul here has been coming and or like I said, we come to the actual introduction of this letter and Paul had been talking to us about the spiritual blessings of God in the first part of this letter. Paul seemed fit for whatever reason to to go away from his normal introduction and to, to dive into really the, I guess you could say the chambers of, of the Trinity and reveal uh, God's eternal plan of salvation, um, both past, present, and future. In the past, that He has chosen us before the foundation of the world, that He has predestined us to adoption. Um, in the present, that we have redemption through His blood, our present state of being redeemed, and also in the future that we are given an inheritance to Holy Spirit is this seal, or this mark of ownership that we belong to God, and He's the guarantee of that inheritance. Um, Paul, for, for whatever reason, opened up this letter by allowing us to plummet into this, this great doctrinal truth. He opens up right immediately in this letter with speaking about the doctrines of God, the, the, the sovereignty of God, the doctrine of salvation, and, and God's decree of salvation that He gives to His people. And now that we understand verses 3 through 14, Paul leads into this kind of thankfulness of the believers and his prayer for them. And he states here in verse 15, he says, beginning of this, for this reason, uh, and this, fr this phrase of what Paul uses here can certainly mean to what is coming next, or it can even look to the past of what he has just, he just stated and I really believe that Paul is reaching back here when he says, for this reason, for what he's about to say in, the, in, the, in this section that we're going to look at, is that we understand because of verses 3 through 14, because you are chosen, because you have been adopted, because you are redeemed, because you have attained an inheritance, because you are sealed and have the guarantee of the Holy Spirit, that I give thanks to you and I pray for you because you are those things. This is the basis of Paul's prayer here for these believers. And Paul continues to say here, because I have heard, or ever since I heard, or having heard, however you want to translate with the different translations, since I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. And Paul says here that I have heard of your faith in God, and I have heard of your love towards the saints. Paul is attesting here that these people are believers because he has heard of their faith in the Lord and their love towards the saints of God. If you remember back just a few verses that we studied last week, 
Paul used similar similar language in verse 13 when he says, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed or had faith in Him. They, They heard the word. They believed the word. They placed their faith in Christ, which is the response to God's choosing of them. And this is what Paul was hearing about. Paul was hearing the the proof of the truth that all the things of verses three through seven, uh, three through fourteen, were true. That he heard of their faith in Christ. He he heard of their love towards the saints. These their actions were proof of their faith. It was the mark of the believer is is both faith and love. Uh, as Paul wrote to the new believers at Macedonia. He says, uh, he says this in 2 Thessalonians 3, 1, uh, 1 and 3. He says, We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as it is right, because your faith is growing abundantly and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. John wrote in his epistle in, in 1 John 3 and 23, and this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as He has commanded us to love. And that language there that we hear John speaking of is also what Jesus spoke of in Matthew when He talked about the great commandment was that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul and that you love your neighbor as yourself. To love God in this manner can only come through faith and that blossom, blossoming from that faith is the response that we give and that we love our neighbor as ourselves. As uh, even John wrote in John 13 and 34, that this new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, and they shall know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. These people had been chosen by God, they've been adopted into the family, they've been redeemed by His blood, they were given the inheritance. Uh, they were sealed with the Spirit as a guarantee, and now their lives are reflected by what is being produced in their lives. And it had to be, because how else could Paul have heard of their faith or got word of their faith and their love they have in God? But it's by their actions. Their, their faith was producing the works. It wasn't the works producing faith. It was faith producing works. And God's eternal decree had come to pass in their lives. When they heard the gospel, believed in Christ, and from the faith blossomed the works of God in their lives. And Paul is saying here, since I've heard of your faith and love, he goes on to say in verse 16, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. And I think there's an important question that we have to ask here at this point. Is who is Paul thanking for what he had heard about these believers? And the implication here is is that Paul is thanking God because it's in a prayer that he is praying. Paul is not thanking the believers of Ephesus for them placing their faith in God and being saved. Paul is thanking God. And why? Because God is the one who's done the work. The salvation is of the Lord. Paul has just explained in the opening chapters of this book that it was the sovereign hand of God that brought them into salvation. And he's thanking God for bringing them into the salvation plan that he had planned for them in eternity past. A good example of this is in Romans 6.17 where he says, But thanks be to God that you, when you once were slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart. Paul is thanking God for the works, uh, for his works in the people that were once slaves, but have now become obedient to him because it was the work of God and not of man. Great verse that we have read several times over the last several several weeks is is John 1, 12 and 13. Uh, But to all who receive him, who believe in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of what? But of God. But of God. When one comes to faith, it is not to praise the person who has come to faith, it is to praise the God who has brought them to that faith. 
It is to exalt God for his work. It is to exalt God for the things that he has done, that he has redeemed the sinner according to his divine decree. All praise given to God, to his glory. And so Paul is saying here, I thank God for you. I I do not cease to thank God for you. I do not cease to, to pray for you because I know you are a part of the eternal decree of God as recorded in verses 3 through 14. And so Paul praises God for these believers. And now Paul comes here to the the main theme of this passage. And that is what Paul prayed for on behalf of these believers. This is the focus here of this passage of Scripture in verses 15 through 23 is the prayer in which Paul is praying for these believers and what Paul is desiring for these believers uh, to acquire through this prayer that he's asking for. Paul says here in verse 17, he says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, he is praying to God, uh, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is praying to God because uh, he is the one who has blessed us in us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. He is the one who has given us all things. So Paul was praying to, to God the Father and this church being a, a fairly new church and a fairly new set of Christians Paul purposes two things here in what he is praying for, the Ephesian church. The first purpose, I guess you could say, of this, of what Paul is praying for, is that God would give them something. That he may give, as he says there in verse 17. And there's two things in which Paul prays here that God would give to them. And the first thing that he prays here for is that he prays that God would give them wisdom and revelation. Listen to what he says, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Now, in the Greek, there is no definite article here before the Spirit, so it just would say Spirit. And some translators have translated this to be the human spirit. It's like the spirit of love or the spirit of wisdom. But most would agree also that this is speaking of the Holy Spirit, and I believe also as well. But if we take this as being the Holy Spirit here, we have to take this in this context to realize that Paul is not appealing to God that he would give them the Spirit, Paul is not praying that God would give them something because God has already given them the Spirit, as we read about in verses 13 and 14. This is not something that they will possess for the first time. It's something they already possess. Paul is praying that the Spirit that they already possess will grant them a deeper wisdom and revelation of knowing God better. Growing in the relationship of God. Paul prays later on in in this book of Ephesians, for the filling of the Spirit in greater measure in Ephesians 5 and 8. He says, Do not be drunk with wine, which is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. So there are some degree of the Spirit working in our lives. And Paul is praying that they would grow in this wisdom. They would grow in this, this knowledge and understanding of God. And these two things are, go together. Revelation and, and wisdom, they go together. I guess as one author wrote, if you want to put a definition on it, Revelation uh, deals with God imparting knowledge. Wisdom is our use of that knowledge. But the emphasis here is on that Paul is praying that only these things can only be accomplished through the working of the Holy Spirit in the lives of the believer. <coughs> It is the Spirit that gives wisdom. It is the Spirit that gives revelation of the knowledge of God. It is the Spirit that works in these things. Paul uh, speaks about the wisdom being imparted to us through the work of the Spirit. Uh, In in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, when he's talking about the gifts of the Spirit, He says here in verse 1, he says, Now concerning the spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. Listen to what he goes on to say. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except in the Holy Spirit. Only only God can, only the Holy Spirit can reveal that truth to us, that Jesus is Lord. And now, 
There are varieties of spirit, but the same uh, variety of gift, but the same spirit. There are variety of servants, but the same Lord. And there is a variety of activities, but the same God who empowers them all in every one. To each one, He gives the manifestation of the Spirit for a common good. For to one is giving through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to the other the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. And so He speaks of there of the Spirit giving wisdom and, and knowledge. If you want to correlate the two together, you can also look in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 6, where he talks about the disciples, or making the, appointing the deacons, and it said they were filled with the Spirit and of wisdom. He even spoke of that in, of Stephen in Acts 6 and 10, where he said they could not withstand the wisdom and the Spirit in which he was speaking. Jesus promised us in, in John 14 and 26 that the Spirit will come and he would teach us all things. In John 16 and 13, he said he would guide us into all truth. The Spirit is to give us wisdom concerning the things of God. But it's also there to give us revelation of the truths of God. It is to reveal God's truth to us. Um, this is not revealing new revelation into God's character. This is not revealing new revelation um, of God, the plan of salvation. Uh, this is revealing the truths of the Scriptures that are before us. Um, Paul wrote in... Ephesians chapter 3, in verse 3, it says how the mystery was made known to me by revelation. As I've written briefly, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men and other generations that is, has been revealed to the holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. The Spirit is revealing the truths of God to us. Probably one of the greatest passages on this, and we've read this a couple weeks back, I believe, is in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And I think it's just worthy for us just to read it again because it's Scripture and it's truth. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7, he says, We impart a secret and the hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages of our glory are for our glory. None of the rules of this age understood, uh, none of the rules of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not crucify the Lord of glory. Because as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the hearts of man imagine what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through what? Through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? And so also, no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given to us by God. That we, that through the spirit, we might understand the things that have been freely given to us by God. That's how we understand these things. That's how we understand the Scriptures. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit. Interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And that, that's the reason why our world reads or hears the Scripture taught, and it does not make sense to them. It's the reason why they, they are rejecting the doctrinal truths of Scripture. And even in our churches today, we're rejecting the doctrinal truths of Scripture. And, and we're, we're, we're appealing to the wisdom of humanity by changing and altering the things of Scripture. And dummying down the Word and, and speaking of entertainment and all these things. Because we are compelling to people who are in essence, who are lost and cannot understand the spiritual truths of God. The natural man, for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but he but he is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. It is the spirit that works in our lives as believers to give us the wisdom and revelation of the knowledge of God.
some have even come to say that this would be associated with the Spirit coming on the Messiah. In Isaiah 11 and 2, it says, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon Him, and the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. The same Spirit that rested on the Lord Jesus Christ is the same Spirit that God has sent to rest in the hearts and live in the hearts of the believers to give wisdom and revelation of the things of God. Paul is praying here for this young church and these young believers. I'm praying to God ceasing, without ceasing. I'm praying constantly that as you, as you walk in this journey, as you have come into the faith and realize that you are a chosen generation, that you have been adopted into the family of God, that you have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, that you have attained an inheritance, that you've been given the Holy Spirit, that you've been sealed with a promise, you've been given a guarantee, that you would understand that God will give you the wisdom of what it means. He will give you the revelation of that knowledge of who you are in Christ Jesus. And the second part of what he prays for God to give to them is also an enlightened heart. He says in verse 18, having the eyes of your heart enlightened. The heart in the Old Testament or in Judaism was metaphorically the place of a person's intellectual or spiritual life. For Paul to say the eyes of your heart, he is using metaphorically of someone's inner being or center of personality. It's a metaphor for a spiritual capacity of the sermon. Paul is praying for the person's intellectual and spiritual life to be enlightened to the knowledge of God. And we must understand this in the same manner in which we understood that Paul was praying that you give that you give you the Spirit. He is saying that they have already been enlightened because he, he uses it in, what, in what's called the perfect tense, which means that it's an already an action that has already taken place. When he says it here, he's saying you've already been enlightened. Paul was praying for a more extensive enlightenment to take place in their hearts. This word enlightenment can can also be translated to mean illumination. Is to bring to light something that is in darkness. I like what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. As God spoke in creation, let there be light, and He illuminated the earth. God has spoken through the gospel. He said, let there be light, and He has illuminated the hearts of the believers. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8, Paul says to preach the, to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, he says, Who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of His own purpose and grace, which He has given us in Christ Jesus before the age, ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who abolished death, and listen to this, brought life and immortality to light, through the gospel, enlightened, illuminated this truth through the gospel. Paul is praying that God will provide profound insight into his own person and will for these believers. I can imagine Paul is just crying out to God. That these young Christians, through the power of the Holy Spirit living in their life, would just grow in the wisdom and revelation and their hearts would be enlightened to the truths, the rich truths of His person and His character and His love for them. Paul prays that God would give them wisdom and revelation and enlighten their hearts for the work through the work of the Spirit. But the second thing that Paul prays for here. It's not only that, that God would give them this in wisdom and revelation and light and heart, but that God would, that they would know. This is what he says here in verse 18, that you Gentile believers may know 
And what Paul is doing here is he's appealing to the intellect of the people to to have a greater knowledge of God. Paul is, is, is not desiring for them to experience God emotionally. He, he is not praying, God, I hope these people have a great experience with you. I, I hope they feel happy. I hope they, I hope they are touched by you in, your, in their soul and their spirit. That is not what Paul is praying for here. Paul is praying that they may know you, that they will grow in knowledge of you. He, he is speaking to, to their intellect to grow in the knowledge of God. And the only way that could be done is teaching and learning the doctrinal truths of Scripture. It's digging into the Scriptures. It's struggling with the Scriptures to know the truths of God. It is not appealing to the emotions or the felt needs of, of the people. It is, it is teaching the Scriptures. It is learning the doctrines of God. And Paul gives... Three things here that he desires for them to know through the wisdom and revelation of the Spirit. The first thing he he desires for them to know is God's calling on their lives. Listen to what he says in verse 18, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. This is a request for God to enable them to grasp all the divine blessings that Paul's explained in verses 3 through 14. Paul wants these believers to know that God has chosen them and that a time is coming where God will bring all things under the lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants them to know the hope that they were called to. God has called you to salvation. Paul is writing for them to understand the hope of that blessed call, and that should be the sure foundation on which they stand on. Paul affirms this in his confession of faith in in Ephesians 4 and 4, where he says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your calling. And this is not something that the the Ephesians people possessed at one time. In in Ephesians 2 and, and 12, it says, Remember that you were at one time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. They did not always have this hope that was in them. But now that you know your calling, now that you know that God has chosen you as His people, then you should live in the foundation of this hope. And this hope within Scripture is oftentimes associated with God's future for His people. God calling us out of the world and into the rest of His eternal presence. Romans chapter 8, verse 23, Paul writes, says, not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this we hope, or in this hope we were saved. And now hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what he sees, but if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, Paul says, but we are citizens, but our citizenship is in heaven. From it, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transfer our lowly bodies to be like this, His glorious body by the power that enables Him even to subject all things to Himself. And, and this was so important for the Ephesian believers here. Because of the hostility they were facing, by, for, for being a Christian, for the hardship and the trials that they were facing by placing their faith in Christ during this time. 
I mean, Ephesians was, was the pinnacle of paganism. Um, deities and, and tombs and temples were there to worship. And for them to deny their pagan beliefs brought hostility on them. And Paul wanted them to know, verses 3 through 14, that they could rest their confidence in that hope. And that hope is that there is one sovereign God who has unfolded, who unfolds history according to His will. And His will. And God has called people into relationship with Himself through the Lord Jesus Christ. And He will fulfill what He has planned according to what He has decreed. That is the hope on which we stand. And as Paul says in, 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 in Ephesians 1 and 11, according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will. That is the hope. And even in our world today, as we, we may face hardship in our world today, and, and the, the constant pressure that is coming more so and more so on Christianity and standing for the truth, that we can rest assured in the hope that God is going to fulfill His promise given to His people according to His purpose, according to the counsel of His will, according to the glory of His name. God's going to accomplish it. There's nothing, as we've read when we studied that passage, nothing that can throw up the plan of God. And so we can rest in that hope. The hope into which we have been called. The second thing that Paul prays for here is the wealth of God's inheritance. Listen to what he says here in verse 18, that you may know what are the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints. And Paul brings up again the inheritance. And of course, there's that small dilemma of is it our inheritance or is it God's inheritance? And I really believe in this context, he is speaking of God's inheritance, that what are the riches or the wealth of God's inheritance in the saints, which is the believers. So we've looked at before, the people of God have been described before as being his inheritance. And in Deuteronomy 9 29 it says, For they are your people and your heritage, whom you brought out of uh, are brought out by your great power by your outstretched arms. Um, God redeemed Israel from Egypt. Um, and they became His possession, his, his heritage, His inheritance. And now Jesus Christ has come and, and God has acted in a greater way of redemption, of redeeming His people through the blood of Christ. And He has gathered His people as His possession, as His inheritance. And by Paul using the term here, riches and, and glorious, it refers to wealth or value. And what Paul is attesting to here is how deeply God values and cherishes His people. That we are God's incredibly valuable and glorious inheritance. God chose us to be His possession, His inheritance. That was a value to Him. And this is what Paul desired for them to know. F.F. F. Bruce made, made this wonderful statement. Let's listen to what he says here about this. He says, he says that God should set such high value on a community of sinners, rescued from perdition, and still bearing too many traces of their former state, might well seem incredibly might well seem incredible were it not made clear that he sees them in Christ. As from the beginning he chose them in Christ. The supreme place in the love and purpose of God which Christ occupies is attested in Colossians and in this letter alike, as indeed in all of the Pauline correspondence. God's estimate of the people of Christ, united to Him by faith, partakers of His resurrection life, inevitably consistent with His estimate of is inevitably consistent with His estimate of Christ. Paul prays here that his readers may appreciate the value which God has placed on them, 
His plan accomplished his, his plan accomplished his eternal purpose through them as the first fruits of the reconciled universe of the future in order that their lives may be in keeping with this high calling that they may accept in grateful humility the grace and glory thus lavished on them. We are to know what great value and worth God has placed on us as His inheritance. And not because of who we are. Not because that we are great or we are worth anything. But because He sees us in Christ. The greatest treasure of the Father's heart. Remember what Paul says throughout Ephesians 3, 14. In Christ, in Him, in the Beloved. And we are valued because we are in Christ the beloved of God. And the third thing that Paul prays for here, and we're, we're not going to get into this, I just want to mention it because the rest of this chapter really unpacks what Paul is writing here in verse 19, and we'll look at that more next week. But is the power of God working in the believer. Listen to what he says in verse 19. He says that you may know what is the immeasurable greatness of His power towards us who believe. The immeasurable, the incomprehensible, the greatness of God's power towards us who believe. I mean, what adjectives that Paul is using there to describe the power of God and to know that that power is towards us who are believers. And Paul wants the believers to know what power God has towards us. Just in closing, I, I told you earlier that I really felt when Paul said in verse 15 that for this reason that, that Paul is causing us to look back to verses 3 through 14. And, th- and though I believe whenever Paul was saying here, I'm praying to God that to, to give them wisdom and revelation and enlighten my heart and, and that, he, that you may know the hope and the riches of his inheritance and the power. I, I believe he's talking about all things that, that, that persist of God, but I cannot help but think it's connecting us back to verses 3 through 14 and specifically to our salvation. Because Paul says, I desire that you know the hope of your calling. In verse 12, he says that we who were the first to hope. He talks about the riches of his glorious inheritance. In verses 11 and 14, he talks about obtaining an inheritance, a guarantee of our inheritance. He says in verse 19, the immeasurable greatness of his power. And I believe all that God did in verses 3 through 14 is an act of the immeasurable greatness of his power. That God, from the foundations of the world, chose sinners, adopted them into His family, redeemed them through the blood of Christ, forgiving their sins, given us an inheritance, making us His own, guaranteeing us an inheritance. That is an immeasurable greatness of His power. It shows the greatness of our God. And Paul is praying here for these believers to know and understand who God is and who they are in God. What a great truth. What a great truth. Anybody else has anything they want to add or or say? Yeah, that that last um, just reminds me of um, there's two passages that and I can't remember. Psalm twenty five eleven is one of them. It says, "For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for you know it is great." And so no matter what it is, it it you know pardon my guilt. And so we talk about 
this inheritance that it is from him, it still evolves back to him. And to, you know, for your name's sake. You know, it is about for, for God, all of it, and for his glory. I think it's what he's also, as you pointed out, that he's also saying. Absolutely. Um, I mean, so... Yeah, I mean, you, I mean, you look at three verses, you know, three to fourteen. I mean, Paul yeah. mentions three times is for the glory of, you know, for His name, for His glory, for the sake of His name, um, and you know, even in the inheritance, we are His inheritance. We're given an inheritance, but it's all for the glory of of God. It's all for the glory of His name that we receive those things uh, from God, because um, definitely we're not worthy, and definitely we didn't do anything to earn it. And so it shows the greatness of who God is to give anything to us as sinners. Um, great truth. So the, the, the Holy Spirit, and, and does, how, how does this then relate into the gifts of the Holy Spirit? As, some are given this and some are given that. You know, we, we'll read, I think this we get in Ephesians chapter 4, about you know, teachers, preachers, apostles evangelists and things like that but, but the individual, the gifts that are given, how then does that play? I mean there was a there was an article in Modern Reformation I think it was last month's article about you know the gifts of the Holy Spirit I mean we're talking about this knowledge and this wisdom and things like that so this really isn't pertaining to that um, I, I think this on this level Paul is, is praying that they will grow in this understanding of God, this this revelation of God. Um, not saying there's not specific spirits or gifts of this, but in, in this context, it seems like Paul is doing it more of a general for the whole entire body of the church or, or believers. Um, he's not really specifying a, a specific gift here as much as he's saying, I desire that God would give you a spirit of wisdom, um, of revelation, of of the things of God to grow in this knowledge of God. As he goes on to say, you know, when he talks about he's given apostles and prophets, teachers, and all these things, it's for the edification of the church, that the church may grow in these things. And so in this particular context, I believe he's speaking more of a, I guess you could say in a general sense, than necessarily a specific sense of given a spirit of wisdom or given a spirit of knowledge. I think his context here is to say that the spirit is the one who gives those things. Spirit is the one who brings revelation of the scriptures. The Spirit is the one who teaches and gives the wisdom that we need, the wisdom of God. So I think in that con- in this context here, he's speaking more of a general than necessarily in the spiritual or, or the spiritual gifts thing. Yeah. If not, we'll close in prayer.